Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So excited you're here. Happy 2024. And you know what? I'm still talking about short-term rentals. It's still a hot investment property. And so I thought I would, um, in this video, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about how to identify a property to see if it would make a good short-term rental. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to make myself small and make the slides um, bigger. But uh, we're going to talk about short-term rentals and how to identify ideal properties so that you can see like if a property you're looking at could possibly be a short-term rental. So first off, let's talk about is there still a demand for short-term rentals? Oh my gosh, yes, there is. So I just updated this information. So um, it's estimated there's 1.3 million vacation rentals in the United States. 60, many, 60 million people annually are using a short-term rental. The average nightly rate, now this is across the U.S., is $259 per night. And super host status, those hosts are earning 22% more than non-super hosts. And so if you don't know what a super host is, that's uh, part of the Airbnb reward system for, you know, being a good host, basically. And right now, as I'm recording this, the short-term rental market is valued at $100.8 billion and is expected, and that number is from 2023, and this is 2024, and it's expected to reach 228 billion and over by 2030. So even though you're hearing about all of these restrictions and um, bans, it's still a growing industry. So obviously, uh, the most important thing is to make sure you are investing in the right place, right? Um, Oh, I see. All right. Sorry for that little glitch there. So, okay. What are the benefits? Okay. Still higher rental income than uh, long-term rentals, easier maintenance because you got the person going in and out. And so you're able to catch those pesky little repairs, like, I don't know, torn window screens or a leaky faucet, as opposed to a long-term rental that, you know, you might not know about for months and months. Control and flexibility. So I know on some of my short-term rentals, if I want to use them, I just don't open them up. So you're able to say, okay, for this uh, holiday weekend, I'm going to charge $100 more a night. For my low season, I'm going to, you know, maybe reduce my price a little bit. So you have flexibility, not only on availability, but what you're going to charge. And in both long-term and short-term rentals, yes, there is value appreciation and tax advantages for having both types of properties. So in today's world, what are today's challenges? Well, these are the top challenges of hosts, right? So keeping on top of guest communication. Remember I talked about super host status. So part of the communication is how fast you respond. And also the good guest communication has to do with, you know, people feeling satisfied and having a good guest experience, hence leaving you a good review. And then establishing short-term rental prices because the market is oversaturated in different areas, you may have to have a different pricing strategy. So you want to make sure that you have, um, you know, kind of control over what you're charging every night. Uh, sometimes if you have someone managing, like a company managing your um, property, you don't have that control. So make sure that you have that control of changing the prices. Uh, man, managing a vacation property, mostly the cleaning and maintenance. So if you're like me and you're, you're a hands-off type of management person, you have to rely on a good cleaning company. So what I have to do is really manage a good cleaning crew, right? And so some things that have happened to me, you know, you don't know about it until, you know, the guest is telling you. So for example, I had a guest check in, uh, everything was smooth until the next morning when they let me know that when they went to bed that night, 11, 30, 12, they turned down the one of the beds, turned down the comforter, and there were no sheets on the bed. Hello. Now, fortunately, I do keep extra sheets uh, in my properties just for, you know, guests if they have accidents or things like that. But hey, cleaners, you know, that's kind of a, a um, fundamental thing that you should be checking. So sometimes when these cleaning crews, they get so big, right, that they, they hire people and they don't have any 
quality control in place. So you want to make sure you're working with a team that does. And then dealing with double bookings. So you can avoid this through having different platforms that you use uh, for, you know, managing your calendars, especially if you're going to have it, have your listings on more than one platform, more meaning more, you know, you're going to have it listed on Airbnb, VRBO, booking.com, Expedia, Furnished Finders, all the different ones. Well, how are you going to manage all of that? Right. So the last thing you want to do is have to do with double bookings. And then um, you want to be able to optimize your short term rentals with, you know, good listing descriptions, good pictures, um, you know, placement on the platform. So now let's talk a little bit about impacts to a community, because if you're in any kind of metropolitan area, your city, you know, or or um, maybe HOA is trying to come up with some restrictions and some bans for short term rentals. So let's talk about why short term rentals have a, have a negative perception. OK, so number one, la loss of housing affordability. So let's talk a little bit about that. So what a lot of people think is that if you use your property as a short term rental, that you're impacting the number of houses that people could live in. So I kind of challenge that because if you are an investor, you're going to have long term rentals. So when they're talking about affordability studies, are they talking about people that you know can't buy homes, which that's across the nation, right? Home prices are just soaring. So I don't know that short term rentals are actually you know, making a, a huge impact in that area. I think just, you know, the availability if you're using short-term rentals or are they talking about houses that people can rent? So very interesting take on that. Um, then disruption to community co cohesion. So again, I think it goes back to hosts. You know, bad hosts can give a, na a bad name for the whole industry. So if you're someone who's not making sure the trash is picked up, that, um, you know, you have unruly gas, that there's a lot of noise complaints, you know, disruption to the neighborhood. So I've lived in um, a neighborhood where they had short term rentals. I didn't even know short term rentals were going on. And that's what you want, right? You want it to seem um, seamless, if you will. You don't really want to, you know, bother your neighbors. But that's, you know, that's one of the concerns that are coming out in some of these bands is because that hosts aren't, you know, taking care of their properties. They aren't, um, you know, like I know one one case where the trash is just a constant problem. You know, the owner is out of state. They don't have a good manager. And so there's constantly, you know, tr the trash bins out front are constantly uh, full. And then, of course, noise and safety concerns. So those are some of the reasons why you're hearing about all these bans and restrictions is because these are the top impacts to a community. Now let's talk briefly about, you know, long-term and short-term rentals. So if you've never had a long-term rental, then this may be new to you. Um, if you do have long-term rentals, then you probably already know this. But number one, location is key to having a short-term rental. So you can have a long-term rental pretty much anywhere. Pretty much wherever there's a need for housing, you can have a long-term rental. But with a short-term rental, that's not necessarily the case because there has to be a reason for people to want to come there. You know, what is it, you know, near a hospital or university? Is it near a tourist attraction? What would make someone come to your area to stay in a, in a short term rental? Of course, the lease terms are different. Lease terms on a long term rental are normally like, you know, one year. Um, and then with the short term rental, you know, they're usually, you know, three, four days, you know, maybe what's called midterm where you're doing like 30, 60, 90 days, but they're generally less than 28 days. Um, the income that you can charge on a long-term rental is higher if you can get bookings, right? So if you can get, let's say $200 a night and you can book for 20 uh, nights, that's going to be 4,000. Did I do my math right? 200 times 20, 4,000 a month, as opposed to maybe you can only get $2,500 uh, for the same property for a long-term lease, but you're going to have more holding cost cost, right? So on both properties, you're going to pay for your insurance. You know, if you have a mortgage, you're going to pay property taxes. But with a short-term rental, now you also have the cost of utilities, lawn service. If you have a pool, pool service, hot tub service, cleaning, uh, the cost of restocking. You know, initially you're going to have the cost of furnishing, but then as you go on, you're going to have to restock supplies, 
linens, toilet paper, you know, cleaning supplies, coffee supplies, uh, toilet paper, you name it. So those are going to be ongoing costs. So you have to kind of weigh, you know, what are your ongoing costs going to be versus a long-term rental? Because that also helps to decide if it, if your property can be a short-term rental. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, furnishings, but then security deposits. Generally, you don't charge a security deposit for short-term rentals. Now, some people do, and that's fine, personal preference, but just know if your competition is not charging a security deposit and your property is similar. So if I find two properties and one has a $500 or $1,500 security deposit, I'm probably going to go with the other property. Now, if you're renting for longer, you know, so for 30, 60 days, then you may want to charge a security deposit. So that's the cool thing. You can be flexible. It just has to be in your listing, right? So you just have to disclose it. And then in a long-term rental, you can do very thorough background checks and on short-term rentals, you know, you're not going to be able to do um, as much of a background check, right? So it, depending on the platform you're using, you know, you can get a copy of the ID, but you're not going to run them through the whole, you know, application process, if you know what I mean. Now, when I look at evaluating uh, potential properties to see if they would be a short-term rental. I'm looking at my key factors, which we're going to go into next. I'm looking at my location attractions. I'm looking at, is there any neighborhood restrictions? And I'm looking at features and amenities that other uh, like properties have. So let's talk about the key factors. So the very first thing I'm going to do, I've identif uh, identified property A. I'm going to make sure that the area that I'm looking at does ha not have any restrictions. There's no city restrictions. There are no HOA restrictions. There are no deed restrictions. So make sure you do your due diligence. A lot of times you can just go on a city's website, an HOA's website, and you can find out that information. Get a copy of If you're getting ready to buy a property, get, get a copy of the deed restrictions and read it, right? And read it. Don't assume that if there are other short-term rentals in the area that it's okay for you to do because maybe they're grandfathered in. You don't know. So you have to make sure that you can do short-term rentals in the area. And then, of course, I'm going to look at saturation. How many are, properties are already in the area? You know, I don't want to be competing with, you know, 500 properties in a five-mile radius. So you want to see what kind of saturation levels there are. And then pricing. How much money am I going to be able to really make? And there's tools that can help you decide that. And then exit strategy. I always believe that you should have an exit strategy for your short-term rentals because, a, the market can change. B, the area that you're in, they could decide to, you know, do away with short-term rentals. So you just have to be prepared. So in my area, I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And as of this recording, um, here's what was going on. So Dallas, uh, in the end of 2023, they were going to end, you know, ban short-term rentals in, in certain areas. And so then some short-term rental owners got together. This is the power of, you know, getting together. And now they, and they had an injunction, so it stopped it. And they actually have a trial coming up in June of 2024. So I'm recording this in February of 2024. So I'll have to do an update later on. Um, Plano, I was invited to their meet and greet. They hired a, um, basically a consulting firm to come in and do a study of, uh, and so they're a task force to do a study about short-term rentals in Plano, Texas. So that was very interesting because you got to see some of the recommendations that they're getting ready to make to the city council. They haven't passed them yet, but um, so that was very inter interesting. Some of the things that they suggested um, was like all owners have to go through an annual training. So of course I, you know, I responded by saying, hey, call me. But also, um, and I think you'll see this more and more, they're just going to require a registration uh, and pay a fee, which is what Frisco, Texas has done. So you can register your short-term rental. You can pay, an, uh, pay a fee annually. And then uh, Arlington, Texas, I mean, they're all over, everywhere pretty much in, the, in Texas. Now, that's just cities. And there's also HOAs that have their bans. So I think the, the hard part for people that want to invest in short-term rentals is that the city can say one thing and then the HOA. So there's no uniform, um, 
there's no uniform way of how these entities are banning and restricting short-term rentals because it's kind of new. So everybody's kind of working through it. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're looking to buy a property so that you can say, okay, well, what are they doing? Are they talking about it now? So if they're talking about it now, then maybe a year from now, they'll have like Dallas, they've been talking about it for quite some time. Um, and so, you know, if you buy a property in Dallas, just know that there could be changes. And one of those changes could be a ban. Maybe not, but, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Now, how to find the competition. So this is going to just take you like not even five minutes. So you're and maybe you already know how to do this. But if you're someone who does not know how to find out how many Airbnbs are in a certain area, this is where you're going to learn it. So first off, you're going to go to the Airbnb platform. And the reason you're going to go there is because it's the most popular um, place where, where properties are listed, right? I mean, you could do this on the other ones, but uh, Airbnb is, you know, by far the most popular. So what you're going to do is you're going to go on as a guest. Don't log on as a owner, you know, don't, you know, just log on as a guest um, or just go to the site. Don't even log on because you just want to search for a property. And what you're going to do is you're going to type in the area, right? So let's say you want to look for Dallas. And if you, you know, when you type it in, I'm just going to go to the next slide and I'll show you what that looks like. So you're going to just type in like the area that you want to live, um, that you're looking for, looking as in where the property that you're interested in is located. So it could be, you know, Frisco, Texas. It could be Denver, Colorado. Um, it could be, you know, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. So you're going to put that information in here and then you're going to put in some random dates. And what I mean by this is you don't want holidays because you want to see the most available property. So you want to just put in some random date. I usually do like a Monday through Thursday or a Monday through Wednesday on a non-holiday, non-summer, non-peak dates. All right. Because and you're going to see why here in a second. And then I'm going to put in, so if the if the property I'm looking at is a three bedroom, I'm just going to make the assumption for, for this purpose, for this exercise, that I can sleep six people. So I put that in there and then you hit, you know, you hit the search and a number is going to come up. Okay. And when that number comes up, it's going to tell you the average number of uh, short-term rentals that are currently available today. So I did this exercise with a new investor the other day and we put in the city that he's looking in. It's a small city, right? And he put it in. So the population is probably not even 10,000 and he typed it in and it came back with 500 properties. That's a lot of properties for a city of 10,000, right? So, um, you know, he has to really kind of dive in to see if that's something that he wants to do there. So that just gives you an idea. Then what will happen when you hit the search is this little map from Airbnb will come up. Now you can see this arrow right here. When you hit that, it'll expand the screen. So it'll go like, um, you know, for your full screen for the exercise I'm getting ready to tell you now. And then you see this plus button and you're going to just keep on uh, zooming in and you keep moving around, it takes a little finessing. Um, and eventually what will happen is that your property, uh, the street names will come up. And so you'll get an idea. So all these uh, bubbles here with these prices, those are short-term rentals. So you can click on them and it'll show you what the thing is. And if I click in more, um, so it'll show, so this is the area. This is my red dot. This is kind of where I was looking. So I can see right now that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, probably nine or 10 on here. And if I zoomed in, I would probably find more. Now, I'm a Texas real estate broker, so I might be buying a property and I'm doing some of my due diligence about how much I'm paying for a property from my comps, from the MLS. So what I did here, just to kind of show you how this works, is I found my property that I'm looking at purchasing on the MLS and I zoomed on the map so that I could see the streets, okay? So you can see here, this is a street, this is a hotel, or I'm sorry, a highway. And then this is the Airbnb map. Okay, so I'm going to just go back for a second. Okay, so this is the same map, right? And what I'm doing now is I'm comparing what I'm going to pay for the property to the other properties in the area. And I'm also going to look at how many short-term rentals are in that same area. So you can see there's the same streets. Here's that highway. 
And then these are the short-term rentals. Now see these little dots right here? Those are short-term rentals. And I think that those were booked, right? Um, but if I click in more, I can get the street. Um, I don't get the addresses, but I do get the street name. And then that helps me. So I can see that there's a lot of short-term rentals in this group. And I can figure out what the average price is um, for that particular area. Because when someone searches for my property, they're also going to find uh, what will happen is that other properties will pop up on the Airbnb platform. And so it shows the person that's getting ready to book some other alternatives. So you want to be prepared that A, you're not the most expensive. And if you are the most expensive, that it's worth the money, right? So it's about the value. So this is just a very quick way to tell how many properties um, are already a short-term rental. Now, let's talk about some of the location neighborhood characteristics. So first, you've got to ask yourself. So it could be the best price of a property, right? You're getting it, you know, at a discount. You know, it's going to be great. But to make it a short-term rental, you have to be honest. Why would people come there? Why would people come there? If it's out in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing around. I mean, maybe you're going to make it a side. Maybe it's a silo. Maybe it's a glamping uh, situation. Maybe you turned an airplane into a um, short terminal. I mean, people get creative. Maybe it's a tree house. Okay. So it's the attraction, right? But then is it close to swimming, boating? I mean, really be realistic. What would make people come? I just did one right um, uh, just the other day. Someone said, I'm getting ready to spend $950,000 on this property. So I went in to see how many short-term rentals are in this particular area. And there's a lot, but because it's a kind of a river area, they're not high end. I mean, they had a couple here and there that were on golf courses, but they, you know, $950,000, um, you can have a property like that, but you're not going to be able to charge nightly rates, unless it's just knock me off of my socks, uh, you know, place. And then people have to have a reason to want to go there. And then let's talk about the condition of the neighborhood. So again, you might find a really great property and it's beautiful property and you've, you know, you've tricked it out and it looks really great, but the, but your guests don't feel safe there. So after you spend all that money and time and getting on a short term rental and your first one or two guests start talking about how unsafe the neighborhood is. Yeah, you're not going to get any more booking. So you got to think about that. And then also noise levels. So if you're buying a brand new property in a brand new subdivision, then there's doing a whole lot of construction. You know, when's the construction going to be done? Because if you buy a property today and they're still doing construction over the next six to 12 months, but you're trying to get that up and running as a short term rental, you have to think about what will happen from the guest experience. So if there's jackhammers going on at 7 a.m. and it's waking them up, um, if there's a lot of dump trucks going up and down the street making noise, you just kind of have to think about, will people be bothered by this? Will they complain about it? Will they leave me a bad review about it? Because again, the property can be fabulous. You can have it be cash flowing only if you're getting bookings. And the way you get bookings is after your guests are leaving great reviews. So the more good reviews you have, the more views you get, the more views you get, the more bookings you get. Okay. So you have to kind of think outside the box about that. And then you have to think about amenities. So remember the map that I showed you that had all the little bubbles on it with the short term rentals. You could click on those and you can view the pictures and you can see what kind of amenities. Like, do they have a fire pit? Do they have a pool? Do they have a hot tub? Is there free parking? Um, do they have Wi-Fi? If your audience is business travelers, you know, do you have a dedicated workplace? And do you have reliable internet? Nothing's more frustrating than, you know, I'm trying to do a Zoom meeting and, you know, the internet keeps going in and out. And then think about the bed size. Don't just cram as many people. I've seen people want to, you know, they have a three or four bedroom house and they want to put 15, 20, 25 people in there. Well, you know, first off, that's a lot of wear and tear on your property. And when you think about people traveling, you know, think about families. Um, if you have a one bedroom, you know, one bedroom, one bath condo, you know, don't try to get six people in there. That's uncomfortable. That people are going to wait for the bathroom. It's going to wear and tear on your property. If you have a three bedroom, 
two bath property, you know, six to eight people, but don't put bunk beds in two out of the three bedrooms, right? So have a, um, a selection of the types of beds. So when I'm working with new hosts, I say, hey, if you have room for a king size bed, put it in there. Because did you know, that's one of the search criteria that people use to find properties, that and being pet friendly. Okay. So I'm pet friendly, love being pet friendly. Um, I want to say probably, I think I read a statistic somewhere that 95% of the people that are booking short-term rentals have a pet. Now I only take dogs. Um, and that's never been an issue. People say, well, why don't you take other things? Well, I used to be in property management and there's a reason I only take dogs. Now, how do you find out how much money you can make? Well, you got to go to another source. Now, that source that I use is Air DNA. Now, what you need to do is use these tools as an as kind of a benchmark, as kind of like I could, not as the gospel truth, right? So I use the free version. There is a paid version, but I the free version works fine for what I'm going to show you. So what you do is you go on to airdna.com and you want their rentalizer, I think it's called. And you could type in an address here anywhere in the U.S., and you type in how, or you, you uh, adjust how many bedrooms there are, how many bathrooms, and how, how many people you can accommodate. Now, once you do that, you're going to hit the search button, and you're going to come over here. Oh, before I go there, I did want to tell you, there's multiple sites to do pricing strategies. So these are some of the most popular ones. There's Price Labs, Wheelhouse, Beyond Pricing. Airbnb has their own smart pricing, and you don't pay for that. You just use it on their platform. Do read about how to use it because you want to make sure that it's in alliance with what you want to price for your property. Um, and then, of course, AirDNA has a has a paid, um, what I want to say, paid version. Thank you. Um, some are paid, some are free, but you need to learn how to interpret the data, right? You don't just take it. You got to go, okay, but am I really going to get $350 a night? when there's 15 other properties all up and down the street where I'm at. So you've got to look at pricing, saturation, and comparing amenities, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, if you've got a fire pit, you might be able to get $50 more. If you offer, uh, if you have a pool or a hot tub, you might get $50 to $100 more a night, right? So you have to look at these different things. And then remember way back in the beginning, I said you had control and flexibility. So if that pricing is not working, you you can't just leave it there and hope hope that you'll get uh, bookings, right? You want to make sure you go in and adjust as needed. So how does that look? So here's one that I put in and I said, okay, this is a four bedroom, two bath, and it can sleep eight people. So Air DNA came back, remember I have the free version, and it said that I could make uh, $68,000 annually um, that my average uh, nightly rate is $383, but my occupancy rate, which you need to pay attention to, says that I'm going to be booked less than half the time in the year, right? So right now I'm probably not looking at, you know, making 68,000 because then it comes down here and it actually has a way you can put in the exact information, but it'll say, okay, your operating expenses are going to be 26,000, you know, what it's going to cost you, but you can go in there and you say, okay, well, they have my property taxes too low or my insurance is too low. <clears throat> so you can go in there and, and um, you know, make that higher or lower. This is the net income that it's saying, and it's a cap rate of 4.42, which in the investing world is not the best. We're not going to really talk about, you know, what capping cap rates are all about, but if you were looking at an investment property, this is probably not, even if you were just looking at cap rate, they use it slot in multifamily. So, um, so that's kind of tells you the average of what you could get. Now, interesting enough, this was actually a case study I did on a property. And so I went in and the property um, had four bedrooms, four baths, and they said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to sleep 11 people. They're kind of a weird number. And Air DNA came back and said, okay, well, it's, uh, you know, you'll get 84,000. Your nightly rate is 494, but you'll see that the occupancy rate dropped to 47%. Uh, okay. So which was lower. So just to go back a little bit, um, the only change that I made here, whoops, was I said, okay, I did four bedrooms, two bath. Um, did I put eight people? Yeah. And then 68, 
49,383. And then I changed it to four bedroom, four bath, 11 people. And so this went up. Um, the operating expenses went up. It says I'm going to make 53,000, but I already did my numbers. So I know that that 494 is way too high for that area because where this property is located at is there it is, has a high saturation of other short-term rentals. And the average in this area is $349. Um, so if I were to purchase this property with this numbers, it, that would be very misleading. So you can't just take these for the grain of salt. So first you got to look at saturation and then you got to say, okay, well, I'm, you know, the average is like 349. So this number back here is probably more in line with what you could actually get. Right. But then you got to look at the occupancy rate there. So just remember, these are tools and you use them together to make a decision if the property you're looking at is going to make a good short-term rental. Now, don't all, don't forget about your restrictions, your zoning, and your tax. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, restrictions. You can just go on to the city's website, an HO website. Uh, you know, if you're actually buying the property, you know, get the, the title company. Don't rely on the title company or your real estate agent if you're using a realtor to read all of that. You as the owner, if you're the one that's going to be buying that property, you need to do your due diligence to make sure that there are no restrictions on having a short-term rental. And then don't forget that when you're calculating your return on investment, uh, you have to pay a hotel tax. So here in Texas, it's uh, 6%, could be higher or lower in the area that you're in. So make sure you find out what that is. Um, Airbnb does collect that. Um, when they are collecting all the fees and everything and pay it on uh, our behalf if we're in Texas. But if you're in another state and you're watching this, you, you just want to double check that. But it is the cost of doing business. Now, I think this will work. I'm not sure how long this uh, QR code will be up here, but if you want my free short-term rental checklist, just you know, pop your camera up there and uh, you know you can opt in to get your free checklist. And I just want to say thank you for watching. You know, doing these videos is a lot of fun for me. Sometimes, you know, it's hard because you're just talking to your computer when I know that, you know, I'm a very interactive person and, you know, I like it when people ask questions and whatnot. So if you have any questions, you can always email me at nancy at kbnhomes.com. Follow me. Love to have followers um, on my Nancy Wallace Lobs. I'm doing a lot of short-term rental things, you know, tips and tricks and things like that. And then I have a new community called Ignite the Wealth. And this is where we talk about just, you know, finding the hidden resources for income. I have an affiliate uh, associates program that you can find out there. So that one's just launched. And uh, so if you could uh, join the community on uh, Facebook, that would be wonderful. And then, of course, you know, give me a subscribe. A girl likes to have followers and it helps me out because I'm trying to grow my business. So, well, hey, thanks so much for watching. Um, if you do have any questions, you know, get in contact with me. Good luck with your short-term rentals and uh, I'll see you next time.